Should we just go ahead and get started, I guess? Think anybody else is going to come? No? <laughs> Probably not. I wouldn't come if I was me, or you. <laughs> huh? <laughs> so now we're on, on to the last chapter before the first exam, so DNA technologies. So we'll talk about different DNA cloning techniques, expression or recombinant proteins, DNA analysis methods, and then DNA microarray technologies. You guys know any of these? Some of the things we're going to cover today, people are doing today in the lab. <laughs> yeah, and then you're doing the cDNA. So, and then your PCR, you're going to clone that into a vector eventually, hopefully. And then you'll se sequence it, but you won't sequence it with the methods we're going to talk about today. Although I'll show you an animation to remind you of that method. The Sanger sequencing, do you guys remember that from last week? We'll talk about it later. So recombinant DNA is artificially DNA that combines sequences that do not occur together in nature. So it's recombinant. If you ever see like an R, like RAAV they make across the street, that's recombinant adeno-associated virus. So it's it's been recombined with uh, two different species, basically. Or put species DNA there that doesn't naturally exist. Based of much of the modern molecular biology and molecular cloning of genes, we can clone genes into vectors that, that then cause overexpression of proteins. We can analyze what that does biologically in cells or animals. or collect those proteins, we can use them for other purposes, like for medicines. Transgenic animals and food, so we've all eaten transgenic food probably, and uh, I don't know if there's any transgenic animals on the market now. Salmon, is that on the market? Didn't they come out with that? The salmon farms? Hmm? Not the salmon farms, but there's a transgenic salmon that grows really fat really quick. I'm not sure. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's transgenic salmon. I don't remember if it's on the market or not. But plants, there's plenty. Do you guys know what the first plant was or, or what gene they put in there? Marketable plant, anyways? Soy. Huh? Soy. I think it might be tobacco, but I don't know. I know it was the tobacco mosaic virus they used to insert the, a gene for Roundup resistance. So, and that was, that, that virus will infect a lot of broadleaf plants like tobacco. Anyways, continue. So DNA cloning, so basically you're gonna take, take copies of the DNA and make identical copies of it. So for organism cloning, cloning, you guys have done that or heard about that? Take cuttings from plants and you can make an identical copy of the original plant. That's like you take a clone, clone it basically. For DNA cloning, we're just going to take a, a sequence of DNA and make copies of that. So it's basically a way to amplify and make copies of DNA. So we're going to isolate specific gene from the source organism and amplify it in a target organism. So what do you know what gene you're isolating? The GAP DH gene. Yeah. yeah. Which is, do you know what GAP stands for? DH? Glucosamide. No, yeah. glyc glyceraldehyde dehydrogenase. Wait, no, no, it's, no, you're right, it's glucose. No, it's not. Glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, GAP DH. So that's an enzyme. That's part of the, we're going to, this will be the next section, not this test, but, you know, the metabolism section and glycolysis. Anyways, that's, that's pretty much known as a housekeeping gene because all organisms express it and normally it's fairly constant levels. So you, a lot of people use those as controls, GAP, DH, and actin as controls to monitor the expression or the genes that you're trying to extract experimentally. So. Basic steps for cloning is basically you want to cut DNA at the source. 
at the boundaries of a gene. Select the suitable carrier for the DNA, and these carriers are known as vectors because they're used to deliver the DNA to one source or another. I'm going to insert the gene into the vector, insert the recombinant vector into a host cell, and then that host cell will be able to produce multiple copies of that recombinant gene. So, anybody give me any examples of vectors? Look at the book at all. So I know a lot of you have used a vector. That's, a, that's the host or the source organism for methods too, right? So, so the vector you used was what? It was, it was, yeah. No, eco R, R one is an enzyme. Yeah. No, it's the, it's the plasmid backbone. Remember, you insert it as the P gap. The P stands for plasmid, so it's the P gap vector for methods two, and you inserted the gap DH gene that you copied via PCR. So. What we did in methods two is a little different because you can't just cut sources of DNA. If you know the sequence, you know restriction sites, you can cut it and insert it with sticky ends. So, but anyways, we didn't do that. So this is overall, you're going to have a eukaryotic chromosome which is going to con contain DNA of interest. You're going to fragment that and then ligase it into some, re in some plasmid vector. Plasma, it doesn't have to be a plasma vector, that's the most common. Re then you have a recombinant vector, insert it into a host cell that will be able to copy that and you make multiple copies of that and then you can purify that vector and have a large quantity of that vector and then do with it what you will. So, and then these figures just show you the steps up big. So. So restriction endonucleases, anybody tell me what those are? What's an it, a restriction endonuclease? Isn't it cut with the, the end of DNA? Exonucleases cut DNA. So exonuclease means that it's, a, it's an enzyme that cleaves the DNA from the outside in. So free outside ends. A restriction Endonuclease means you're cleaving the DNA somewhere in the middle of that sequence, okay? So it's an endonuclease, and they call it a restriction endonuclease. These are a class of enzymes we discovered in bacteria that's to help restrict any, any like viruses or, or foreign DNA from infecting that cell. So it recognizes sequences and cleaves it. So it's a way to help protect the bacteria from viruses and foreign damaging DNA. So they call them restriction endonucleases, and they're basically serve as like one of the backbones of modern molecular biology. So they're common in bacteria and, and eliminates infectious viral DNA. Some will make staggered cuts, and those staggered cuts, what they mean is they have overhangs, right? Those overhangs are unpaired bases, so they call those sticky because they can base pair with the, the matching, you know, it's complementary DNA if it has sticky ends also. And they'll stick together via what? How do base pairs stick together? Hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds, right. <laughs> so wh which ones form stronger base pairs? C and G's, right, because it's three hydrogen bonds versus two for A's and T's. So some make straight cuts, and those are called blunt ends. So in methods two, I don't know, what kind of cloning are you going to do? Methods two? It's, uh... You did, or tried yeah. both. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but not really, sort of sticky end, because you had an overhanging, you topo A is what you finally were successful with, which when you do PCR, you end up with A's overhanging, and then the topo A ha is a vector with overhanging T's, and it, it's sort of sticky ends, it's just one bait siege. But blunt end is what normally w we would do in methods. Yeah? Oh, oh. <laughs> So blunt ends just means they're, they're, they're blunted at the end, there's no overhangs to base pair with anything. 
So large numbers of restriction endonucleases are known, they're commercially available and well documented. And this NEB website will tell you all about each one. And anybody know how they're named? Didn't you mention one before? Eco R1? R1? And is that where it cuts or something? It's not where it cuts. So they all have their specific cut sites, so they cut at specific sequences. But the Eco. Yeah, Eco means it was you know, isolated from E. coli. Our strain R of E. coli, and then it's the first, the first one identified in that strain of E. coli. That's how they get their name. So it's E. coli strain R, and E. coli R1 is the first restriction in the nuclease that was identified in that strain of E. coli. So, so simple things like that. So. so, and this shows you the examples: sticky ends. You have overhangs versus blunt ends, they're just blunted. And then, and that's how they inserted, there's cloning vectors where they will take a, a normal plasmid vector, they cut it with, in this case with Eco R1, and then they inserted what's known as a polylinker, which is a, a synthetic portion of DNA that has known sequences for a number of different cut sites. So. And then DNA ligase, does, do you guys know what that is? Okay, so this example here is, a, is a, an example of directional cloning. So we have one sticky end and one blunt end, and then you have a portion that has a, a, this, a matching sticky end of the, the chromosomal DNA that you want to insert into a plasmid vector, and then a blunt end also and you'll get it inserted in the vector direction with the proper direction, or the direction that was intended to. Why would you want to insert it in a particular direction, do you know? So, so you can get the, get the direction out of it by kicking up the... Right, yeah, so if you had it reversed, that would be the anti-sense. Yeah. So when you make RNA from that, it would be like the reverse complement of the RNA of the the, the protein you wanted to produce, and it'll actually knock down protein expression for that. And that's one way you can knock down protein expression is introducing antisense DNA. Now, does, does it do anything with the, the surrounding, the surrounding DNA uh, reactions? Does that alter there? With the antisense? Well, when you, when you, when you ligase. When you ligase, it's just gonna, it's just gonna seal any of these gaps with covalent, you know, phosphodiester bonds. So it, it shouldn't mess around with any of the DNA here or, I mean, you're cutting out the DNA that's surrounding it elsewhere, so. So there's different types of cloning vectors and the most common are plasmids. Plasmids are circular bacterial DNAs that, DNA molecules are circular. circular. They're kind of small, they're gonna be less than 15,000 base pairs. If you try to make a recombinant plasmid DNA vector and it's above 10,000 base pairs, those bacteria will find ways to you know, cut portions of DNA that they don't use out of that. Because it takes, you know, it's energy consuming to copy that DNA. And if they're not getting anything out of it, except for anybody know what you put in a plasmid bacteria would like? The way you select for the bacteria that have the plasmid? Checking out the DNA sequence and finding out which ones are in yeah, how do you think it even has the plasma? Nobody knows? I think we talk about it here. About <laughs> so, antibiotic resistance genes. Mm -hmm. So you insert genes that cause those bacteria that have the plasmid to be resistant to certain antibiotics and that'll allow you to select for the bacteria that have that. If you grow it on media that contains ampicillin, the only bacteria that should grow are the ones with the ampicillin resistance gene. Likewise, tetracillin also, or tetracycline, tetracycline. <laughs> so another, anybody see something else up here that, that's required for a plasmid? Right, yeah, so you have to have 
origin of replication on, on a plasmid. That tells where, basically, tells DNA polymerase where to start copying this plasmid. Because the whole purpose of having a plasmid is you're going to make multiple copies or you're going to use it to express protein, which you'd still want to copy that plasmid so you can be able to transform other bacteria. So you need an origin of replication, some sort of selectable marker, and then your DNA is going to go in somewhere. So, and I think other vectors we didn't talk about, you, you can have chromosomes, whole artificial chromosomes that are much larger, up to 300,000 base pairs. So, so you can insert larger pieces of DNA in the artificial chromosomes. There's BAC or bacterial artificial chromosomes that you're going to use in bacteria. And if you guys are in that industrial biotech program, we're going to be making recombinant proteins using a BAC chromosome. Yeast artificial chromosomes for use in yeast. Oh, obviously, it's another artificial chromosome. What's different between bacterial and eukaryotic chromosomes? Bacterial yeah, bacterial circular. And what do eukaryotic chromosomes have? Distinguishing feature. Hmm? Well, they're, yeah, they're going to have histones, but, but you know, they're not circular DNA, so what do they have at the ends? Telomeres. Telomeres? So that's a, a big difference between those. And then your cloning vectors, this shows you back. Typically, you're going to clone into a plasmid, and that plasmid is going to be able to insert into the, 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 the chromosome. It's a large DNA fragment you're going to insert into the back plasmid, making a recombinant back chromosome, basically. And then you're going to transform bacteria. This example shows you electroporation. There's other methods. Electroporation uses a, a, a field that's going to pull bacteria through little pores and cells that you've made competent. And they'll retain that DNA and copy it, hopefully. And then here, they're going to select different agar, and here they, they have, in the vector, there's a chloramphenicol resistance gene, which the agar contains chloramphenicol, allowing the, the cells to grow there. So. And then this is a yak. If you notice, telomeres on the yak chromosome. And anybody know what, what's the benefit of using artificial chromosomes rather than plasmids? much larger pieces of DNA you can put in there. If you remember from a few minutes ago, plasmids, <laughs> as the bacteria reproduce them, if the plasmids are too big, they're going to start cu cutting, you know, getting rid of DNA they don't, they're not, they don't need, which is most of the vector, you, or most of the DNA you put in them, right? So they'll get rid of a lot of that DNA you inserted into them. So DNA ligase, that's an enzyme that's, that's covalently joins two DNA fragments, normally functions in DNA repair and DNA replication. Human DNA ligase uses ATP. Bacterial DNA ligase also uses NAD. So, so and this just shows you how you're going to insert fragments, the eukaryotic chromosome into a plasmid, and then DNA ligase will make that one whole molecule then. So. And another one showing you the same thing. This is how they inserted the polylinker into that. So we were saying antibiotic selection. So antibiotics are used to select for the bacteria that are carrying the vector that you want. So. Plasmids can carry genes that give host bacterium resistance against antibiotics and allow growth of sel selection bacteria, allow growth of the bacteria that have taken up the plasmid. So, so in methods two, do you, do you remember the vector you used? There's two selectable markers in that. And I'm not talking about the TA cloning that you were ultimately. <laughs> So there's two, two selectable markers in the clone you, you're going to use for methods two. There's ampicillin resistance. And then in the plasmid, they inserted a gene that's normally 
lethal to those bacteria, but that's where the polylinker site is. So that's, if you don't have an insert, that plasmid will re-ligate to itself and, and under control of the lac operon, you have not lactose, but a, a lac substitute, IPTG, in the media, they'll start expressing that protein and it'll kill any of the bacteria that don't have that gene interrupted by the insert that you're interested in. So that's a little bit about that vector that you see. And that's another way to select for only taking the bacteria that have the, the DNA insert in them. And we've gone through this a number of times. And they use this example here to to isolate, and this is kind of, I, I don't know anybody who's ever done this. So all colonies here are gonna have plasmids. So they take the plasmids, the, the colonies out, and they spot little spots on agar containing tetracycline and then agar containing ampicillin and tetracycline. And on the cells that grow on the tetracycline, but not tetracycline and amp contain the recombinant plasmid with disrupted ampicillin resistance. So you can compare the two. The ones that grow here but not here are the, are the, are the ones that, that you want to save. So it's similar to what we're, we're doing in methods two, but rather than having a lethal gene, you're interrupting the, the ampicillin gene in this model. So just another way to, to have multiple selection factors. So electrophoresis. DNA has a lot of phosphates, which imparts a negative charge on, on that DNA or RNA. So it's negatively charged and it's going to migrate to the anode in an electrical field. So do you know what an electrical field looks like? So you have an anode and a, patho a cathode. The anode has a net positive charge. Cathode has a net negative charge. So the anions migrate to the anode. Cations migrate to the cathode. And in electrophoreal, you have an ag or electrophoreal. electrophoresis, you have an agrose gel, which basically acts as a sieve. So smaller molecules will travel faster through it. Larger molecules will be hindered and they'll travel slower. So the agrose is going to hinder the mobility of the DNA molecules. The mobility is going to depend on the size and shape. So small molecules are faster. Compact molecules are also fast faster. So this is used to analyze our DNA. Once you're done cloning, you want to make sure you have an insert, so you use the restriction enzymes to cut and then look for that. You can also use it to purify DNA, and then DNA protein interactions are, are done, studies are done using that also. So if you want to identify portions of DNA that bind to certain proteins, you incubate that with the proteins and see if it, how it runs. If it's impeded into that agarose gel, it has protein attached to it. So, so expression of clone genes, if you want to study the protein prog product, there's uh, expression vectors that, that, that'll contain a promoter that'll drive the expression of that recombinant vec gene. Rather, so the sequences will allow transcription, translation of that inserted gene, so you'll the, you'll get production of that protein. So there's expression vectors, and they can be specific to the species of of uh, organism you're going to grow that protein in. So you can grow recombinant proteins in bacteria. I think most of the insulin you buy these days is grown in E. coli. Certain proteins, though, however, to be active, have to have glycosylations. What's a glyco glycosylation? You know? Sugar bond? Yeah, you have sugars you know, covalently bound to those proteins. So certain proteins need glycosylations or post-translational modifications, which bacteria won't do. So you can grow them in yeast cells, insect cells, or mammalian cells to, to produce those. So expression vectors from cloning vectors, they differ. You're going to have promoter sequences, which is going to drive the expression of that recombinant protein. Operator sequences, anybody know what an operator sequence is? See, which we haven't talked about, like the lac operon. So it's, it's a sequence that, that has control. There's a regulatable promoter sequence, and it's that, that control of that. Op the operator controls the, the expression of that gene. Code for a ribosomal binding site. So 
there's so in bacteria, all the you, you produce an mRNA, and those ribosomes will just go on that. You can produce multiple proteins from one mRNA. In eukaryotes, do you, do you know the differences between message RNA and eukaryotes and prokaryotes? No, most seeds are not You don't need to do. Intron, right? Yeah, there's no introns in, in bacterial DNA. So there's post-translational processing of the RNA for eukaryotes, but they also have like a 5-methyl cap. So that's a binding site for ribosome, ribosomes, that, 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 that 5G cap on one end. But there's also specific sequences known as internal ribosomal entry sites that will also be a binding site for a ribosome. Transcription terminator sequences also. So there's once you start producing the, the 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 mRNA, there needs to be a terminator sequence so you know when to stop making mRNA copy of that DNA. And there's several different type of sequences for that. So this is your typical expression vector. So gene coding for the repressor that binds the operator, and it's going to regulate the the expression of the promoter. So ribosomal binding site, so you can get the, the, the protein made. And then here's your polylinker site, which is where you're going to insert the coding sequence for the protein. And a transcription termination sequence following the polylinker site. So you'll stop making a message at this site. So you're not making just keep going all the way around the vector to make that message. And again, you need selectable markers and an origin of replication to re replicate that vector. So another technique used in molecular, modern molecular biology are the site-directed mutagenesis. So if you want to understand the function of pro proteins, one, one of the great tools is to be able to change the structure of those proteins by doing one substitution of amino acid. That you can actually determine which residues are important for an enzyme or which residues are important for binding to their, their, their uh, respective binding partners. And you can test these methods by doing site-directed mutagenesis. And to mutate an amino acid, you have to change the nucleotide or nucleotides coding for that DNA to express that, that, that gene. Site-directed mutagenesis normally is going to use chemically synthesized mutated primers. So we haven't talked about PCR yet, but who knows about PCR? So, <laughs> right, so PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, you use a primer, because you have to have a primer anytime DNA polymerase is going to copy DNA. So it binds to, the DNA polymerase will bind to its, its uh, complementary portion of DNA, and then you have a, a five prime, no, a three prime hydroxy group. <laughs> 3 prime hydroxy group where a nucleotide triphosphate can come in and, and add the next base that matches the, the, the following base. But you can make mutated primers that closely match the, the sequence you want to amplify, but don't quite match it. So if you play with the, the, the annealing temperatures, they'll still, still bind, and then you can add DNA to that. And mutated plasmids are always sequenced to confirm the desired and only desired mutation is inserted because, you, because they're not perfectly matched, those primers, they can sometimes go to different places. And this, this, sh this is also known as rolling circle site-directed mutagenesis. What you do is you have your primers, you have a plasmid with the gene inserted into it, primers with the mutation in incorporated, and then you're going to melt the plasmid, anneal the primers, and then amplify the whole thing, basically, with, with your, with your uh, poly DNA polymerase. And then melt the primers again, and you're going to digest the non-mutated parental DNA template with a methylation-specific nuclease and anneal the newly synthesized strands. So you guys knew that Bacteria DNA, bacteria, they'll methylate their DNA, right? Do you know why? One of the, so, the, so you can identify the parent strand from the newly synthesized daughter strand. And for one reason that they do that is in case you get a, if you guys remember those keto, 
ketoenal shifts that, that can occur while DNA is being replicated. If you have a mismatch base incorporated, enzymes will recognize which sequence is the proper sequence and which one you want to cut out. Does that make sense? So which, which strand is newer than the older one? So the older strand, parental strands are going to be methylated in bacteria. The daughter strands are, in this case, you're doing this in a tube. So there's the, the, the new daughter strands aren't going to be methylated at all. And there's specific nucleases that will only degrade methylated DNA. So that's how you clean that up. Purification of recombinant genes. So purification of natural proteins is typically difficult. Although it's possible, but it's difficult. But if you're making a recombinant protein, you can make purification e easy by adding a peptide tag on it somewhere. And there's a number of peptide tags that they can add. There's protein A, which is a bacterial protein that will bind to the FC portion of some IgG. So if you add protein A, you make like a basically a protein A fusion protein with the protein that you're interested in. All you need is a column with, made out of FC and all your recombinant protein is going to stick to that and you'll be able to separate it from all the other proteins in that mixture. Polyhistidine, that's what this is, his with a six, it's a polyhistidine tag. So what that does, you guys remember the, the, the R group on histidine, what that looks like or what that is? It's that, it, it's that cyclic nitrogen containing compound. So it's it's a it's it's it, it's a it, it's a imidazole is what that is called. And what that'll do, imidazole will coordinate nickel. So if you have a column made that that of nickel, a nickel column, anything with a lot of histidines is gonna bind to that. And then you bind, if you have a polyhist tag on your recombinant protein, you bind it to the nickel. Easy way to elute that is if you change the mobile phase from, you know, whatever buffer you're using that had your mixture of proteins in, to a, to a you, you change that mobile phase to a, a, a midazole, a, a, a buffer that has a high concentration of a midazole. The imidazole will bind to the nickel and wash off your polyhis labeled protein. Glutathione S transferase, a GST, binds to glutathione. Maltose binding protein will bind to maltose. Beta galactosidase will bind to P aminophenyl beta thiogalactoside or TPEG. And then chitin binding domain will bind to chitin. So, all different ways to make purifying your recombinant product easy. And this is the overall steps. So this shows you the GST. Gene for your target protein, gene for the GST. You make a, basically a, GS, a, 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 a GST fusion protein. You express it in the cells, extract protein lysate. Then you're going to protein mixtures added to the column. And then on the column, there's a, the GST tag is going to bind to the, 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 the glutathione that's immobilized on solid beads. Typically they're going to use agrose or sephiros beads to have these. And then you just collect fractions and then you're going to add free glutathione is added then to the column just like the free imidazole you would for a nickel column and that washes off your, your, your proteins because it's going to bind now to the glutathione that's in solution rather than the glutathione that's on the, the, the stationary phase. Does that make sense? And then how do you get rid of this? The free glutathione, because now you've got free glutathione contaminating your... That, that's all like a, just filtration, protein filtration? Yeah, but it's going to be bound to the protein you're interested in anyways. We just remove it with the, yeah, with the group. So you can do something that unfolds that, right? You can change the conformation of the protein, denature it, and then run it through like a desalting column or a filtration type device. Or what else? Or some of these vectors, there's a specific protease site that, that's cloned into that site where the fusion protein is made. So you can just use a protease and cleave the two also. So polymerase chain reaction, 
So it's used to amplify DNA in a test tube, can amplify regions of interest. So it's one way you can clone rather than taking chromosomal DNA and just cleaving a gene out and inserting into a vector. This is a more specific way, right? You know the, a little bit of the sequences, so you can amplify the region in between the sequences and insert it into a vector. So you can amplify complete circular plasmids. That's what we saw sort of with that rolling circle site-directed mutagenesis. And you're going to mix together your target DNA, which is known as your huh? template, right? Primers, which are complementary to the target. Nucleotides, so you need deoxy ATP, deoxy CTP, deoxy GTP, and deoxy TTP. And then a thermostable DNA polymerase. So what does that mean, thermostable DNA polymerase? Where do we get the DNA polymerase we use for PCR, do you know? From ocean then the bacteria? Yes, and it's, I forget, thermo aqueous, so TAC is the t thermo, and then AQ is the, I forget the name of the spe species, but that DNA polymerase is active at 72 degrees Celsius mostly. So you can heat it up and it's thermostable because they've adapted to live in those hot vents basically, right? Whereas normal DNA polymerase is going to just be all melted apart at 72 or denatured 72 and even at 95, which is normally where you're melting the DNA at is 95 degrees Celsius. Place the mixture into a thermocycler, melt DNA at, for, at 95, then you're going to cool the separated strands to about 50 or 60, which is your annealing temperature. Primers will then anneal to the target, and then, then, you, pull, then you raise it up to the 72 degrees, which is what polymerase, or tack polymerase anyways, works best that and it will extend the primers in a five to three direction and then after one round of elongation is done you repeat the steps. So why would primers anneal to the target rather than the target annealing back to itself? What's preventing that? The heat. Hmm? The heat. No. Because if you think about it, the, if, the, 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 if you have the template DNA is much longer than those primers are really short so why, you know, why wouldn't it just anneal back to itself? No ideas? Well, if the primers are free, there's a little bit more... Um, yeah, they have a little bit more mobility. More, more mobility to, to alter the, the delta G about it. Yeah. The free energy is... So, so Speaking of delta G, what else alters your, your, your free energy of a reaction? Delta S. Well, well, yeah, but concentration, right? So if you up, if you, if you have concentration of primers much higher than the concentration of your templates, chances are it's going to re-anneal to primers rather than the template, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why if you have like in like that mystery meat and methods one or whatnot, you get a ton of DNA. And if you run the PCR with a ton of DNA, you got too much DNA for the primers to really anneal versus the template. So you don't end up with bands if you don't really quantify your DNA and get it to the right dilution. So too much DNA is a bad thing also when you're doing PCR. And this shows you the, the general steps. I think there's a I got something like a a thing to show you also. Yeah. that cursor go there it is Amplify a 
single copy of a DNA segment into billions of identical copies. The DNA segment of interest, or target DNA, is indicated in red. In addition to the target DNA, a PCR reaction contains several other ingredients. These include free nucleotides, DNA primers, and the enzyme TAP polymerase. The primers are typically about 20 nucleotides long and are complementary in sequence to the ends of the target DNA. TAP polymerase is derived from hot springs bacteria and can tolerate the intense heat of a PCR reaction. A PCR reaction lasts several hours and typically consists of 20 to 35 repeating cycles. A cycle begins by heating the reaction mixture to 95 degrees Celsius. The heat denatures the DNA, breaking the hydrogen bonds that hold the strands together. After denaturing the DNA, the temperature is reduced to around 60 degrees so that the primers can form hydrogen bonds or anneal with their complementary sequences in the target DNA. Note that the primers and the target DNA follow base pairing rules. An adenine, A, pairs with a thymine, T, and a cytosine, C, pairs with a guanine, G. In the next phase, the temperature is raised to 72 degrees Celsius. TAP polymerase functions optimally at this temperature and begins polymerization, adding nucleotides to the three prime end of each primer attached to the DNA strand. After one complete cycle, there are two double-stranded copies of the target DNA. The PCR reaction mixture contains many copies of the primers and an abundant supply of nucleotides to perform many additional cycles. After a second cycle, there are four copies of the target DNA. After cycle three is finished, there are eight copies of the double-stranded target DNA sequence. Note that only two of the double-stranded copies consist of just the target fragment. The others also include flanking DNA regions. As the number of cycles increases, the products consist of a greater proportion of fragments with just the target DNA. After four cycles, Half of the fragments consist of just target DNA, and half of the fragments also contain flanking DNA. With each additional cycle, the number of copies of our target sequence doubles. At the end of cycle 25, there are more than 33 million copies of this double-stranded target region. So you're just gonna have that target region then after that many cycles, so you'll have a nice, should have a nice clean band on your PCR reaction, hopefully. Now what do I do? thing got me stuck. What's the difference between a PCR and a nested PCR? Hmm? It's like a PCR and a nested PCR. And a nested PCR? So with the nested PCR, 
your initial primers are not specific. So you amplify a whole host of genes that are there. So basically you want to amplify the, the, the specific portion that you want, but you're also amplifying a bunch of other things because you might not know the sequence specifically for that really well. So you're using like sequences known, but then you look in gen genomic libraries and look what bases change and you put, gener you put like a mixture so it's just of oligonucleotides. The primers aren't all the same. They're like non-specific sort of your initial primer. So then you amplify that region, you normally get a nice like streak of DNA because it's not all the same. And then you digest any of the oligonucleotides that are in there with exonuclease. And then you have specific primers for the region you're interested in. And you amplify that within the nested, you know, the nested portion of the original one. So for some reason this is stuck. <coughs> So DNA fingerprinting, who, who's heard of that? So what, what do they use it for, I guess? They use it for short, some fragments, but they only use like short, short repeats or something? Like yeah, so your short tandem repeats then. So we all have short tandem repeats and they're, they're, they're interspersed with different links between us, basically. So there's like, Basically, differences in the number of repeats cause variations in the length of the fragments between the short tandem repeats, right? And then you can use a sp primer specific for that region, perform PCR, and you'll generate like a profile of your specific DNA fingerprint. Isn't PCR good? Is it like another, another long tandem repeats? Yeah, yeah, there's there's LTRs, short tandem repeats, there's there's a whole bunch. And you you took Brigida's class. Yeah, right? isn't that one that they use for like uh, I think they use it for like DNA analysis of like being able to find out if someone's child or not. Right, yeah, so they, they use those I for think they call it some tandem repeats. I think it's V T R or something. V T Rs? I'm not sure. Variable regions, right? Yeah. Yeah. So then they also use it for matching suspects, right? So there's 13 well-studied locations that are using identifications and based on the number of alleles seen in each location, misidentification is less than one in 10 to the 18th. So that's why they can use those in a court of law. And they'll separate these PCR fragments on a, rather than a, a gel electrophoresis. You can do it with gel electrophoresis but these days it's, it's faster and more accurate if you use capillary gel electrophoresis. And when, we, when you do your Sanger sequencing and methods too, you'll, you'll see how that works if, if you guys take it. And these are properties of low C used for the CODIS database. So it shows you the repeating motif and basically the, the rate, the number of alleles it's seen on. So so adaptions to PCR, reverse transcriptase is one. So that's reverse transcriptase PCR. Does anybody know what that's for? <laughs> yeah, it's used for RNA. <laughs> so reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that, that certain retroviruses will code for. And it just uses an RNA template to make DNA. So you can use this reverse transcriptase to make DNA using RNA as a template. So a lot of people, what we'll do is we'll isolate the mRNA, you know, which contains the coding sequence for the protein we're interested in, 
and then we'll convert that to DNA using reverse transcriptase, and then we can amplify it using regular PCR. So that's known as RT-PCR. Quantitative PCR, qPCR, what, what, what that does is it uses to show, it's used to show quali quantitative differences in gene levels. So a lot of times you'll do RT, the reverse transcriptase to, to copy all the cDNA. Then you can use quantitative PCR from the cDNA that you produced here to look at different levels of gene expression of a specific gene. And way, the way qPCR works, it's fluorescent. So either you're going to have a fluorescent dye that binds to double-stranded DNA in the PCR mix. And that dye, as you increase the number of copies of the PCR sample that, that you're amplifying, you'll see an increase of fluorescence. So when you get that increase in fluorescence, you can kind of judge if you have a, if you have a standard of known amount of DNA, you'll, you can make a standard curve and actually calculate the number of molecules that were in the original sample. Another method, which is the TACMAN system for quantitative PCR, uses three primers rather than two. And the third primer is a special primer with two fluorescent labels on it. One fluorescent label will absorb the fluorescence emitted by the first fluorescent label, and you won't see any of the fluorescence from that first one until when that primer gets chewed up by the five prime exonuclease of the DNA polymerase used, those fluorescent labels are then separated. And as you lose more and more of that fluorescent primer, you'll, the, the fluorescence will increase. So it's a, a more specific way rather than just using a, a dye that binds to the double-stranded DNA. So, and you get graphs like this. So this shows you that fluorescent quenching primer. And it'll fold up like this normally, so that's a, a hairpin loop. And then the quencher is next to the fluorophore. You excite the fluorophore, it'll transfer that to the, the, the quencher, which is another fluorescent molecule. And then when you separate them, you'll get fluorescence. So, so you, eukaryotic gene expression in bacteria, and, and so eukaryotic gene from eukaryotic genome will not express correctly in bacteria. And that's because we have, you know, introns and exons. So you only want the coding regions. You don't want to include the non-coding regions. So that's why a lot of times we use mRNA just to, to express genes in bacteria from eukaryotes. So in, introns and eukaryotes genes pose problems. The bacteria cannot splice the introns out, so mRNA is used rather than free genetic material. You could also, rather than using bacteria to express the plasmid, you could use yeast, insect cells, or mammalian cells. But bacteria are cheaper and faster and easier to, to grow proteins in. So construction of cDNA, so who, who did this today? <laughs> Anybody else? So people are starting to do this now for methods one. mRNA can be extracted from the eukaryotic cell. All mRNA from eukaryotes has a poly A tail. So this helps with the purification because you can have a, a, a poly T column that'll bind to the poly A tails and kind of trap all the RNA there. And it serves as a universal template also. So the DNA strands, so you can have your initial primer be poly T also. DNA strands can be synthesized using mRNA as a template, and then this is catalyzed by the reverse transcriptase. The end result is a hybrid where the DNA strand is complementary to the message mRNA, and the hybrid can then be converted to a duplex D DNA known as cDNA. So you can create a whole library of cDNA like that. So you have your mRNA, start with a poly T primer, or you can purify this mRNA on a poly T column. mRNA DNA hybrid, I think for your cDNA you're not using poly T primers, you're using random primers. So mRNA DNA hybrid, the mRNA is degraded with, I can't read that. Oh, alkali. <laughs> so, and then, you have the other primer, random primers here, and you can make a duplex DNA that way. So, 
Oh, that's, that's not me. So fluorescence can be used to determine protein location in vivo. So have you guys heard of GFP? There's all kinds of different fluorescent proteins now. They, I think they extracted GFP was one of the originals. I think the guy who, who first discovered it and cloned it has the Nobel Prize now. It used recombinant DNA technology to attach GFP to a protein of interest. So you saw how we could make fusion proteins for purifying recombinant proteins. You can make fusion proteins with fluorescent proteins to track the, the protein location in, in cells. You can visualize it with a fluorescent microscope and then see where it is. Immunofluorescence is where you tag a protein with a primary antibody and detect with a secondary antibody containing that fluorescent tag. And protein can also be fused with a short epitope at the of the primary antibody detecting the epitope can be fluorescently labeled. And these are some images of that. This is, these are all the different fluorescent protein colors they have these days. So I think you can buy fish that are transgenic and they'll express those colors. Have you seen those? I saw zebra fish at the pet store that, that fluoresce like that too. And then you can track where they are in the cells. Likewise, immunofluorescence, you're using antibodies to specifically lab uh, to label a protein of interest and you have secondary antibodies that have a fluorescent tag. In this example, they, they have antibodies looking for DNA polymerase, which is likely to be found near, you know, the, do you know what piece DNA is? Prol proliferating cell nuclear antigen. So it's, it's actually that clamp protein we'll, we'll learn about later, DNA synthesis. So DNA polymerase is found near PCNA, and BRDU is, is a, it's, it's a, gets incorporated in the copying DNA. It's, it's, it's got a bromine on it, on a DU, so it gets incorporated, it's an analog, it gets incorporated in the DNA that's copying and then you can have an antibody directed towards that. And if you look, they're all merged together in that cell. That's why you do look at different colors. You can see that they're co-localized. Or visualization, visualization of a protein location from a GFP tag cDNA library. So you can make a cDNA library and have each construct a fusion protein with GFP. Then you express it in a cell and see where those proteins are, basically. And I, got, I found this little movie here that I think is, uh, has RFP. It's super fast, four seconds long. And now how do I get back? So do you see like the, the, there's, okay, GFP labeled actin and there's RFP, red fluorescent protein labeled Golgi bodies. And you can look at the Golgi apparatus being networked in live time throughout the cell. Can you guys see that or is it kind of hard? See the red moving? Mm -hmm. Wish you could slow this down. They have it going so fast. So those are actual Golgi bodies being supported around the cell. <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty, pretty cool stuff. So you can actually study what happens to the proteins. In fact, not only that, you can look at pairing of proteins to see if they interact. You can put a portion. GFP requires two parts of its protein to fluoresce. You can take half of GFP, make a fusion protein out of half of it, and then fusion protein out of the other half to see if those proteins interact and those two portions of the GFP molecule come together you'll get fluorescence. So is this going to ruin me again? Hopefully not because it's still there. So identifying protein-protein interaction so that's kind of like what I was gave you an example of. Put an epitope tag on one protein in the con complex and gently isolate the epitope tag protein will also isolate stably interacting protein. Anybody ever hear of immunoprecipitation? So it's similar to what you're doing here. So you have an epitope tag protein and you isolate that and anything that comes with it are proteins that are naturally associated with that protein you're interested in. You can use the epitope tag 
to bind to an IgG, and then you can use something like protein A bound to sephiros or some kind of insoluble material to actually precipitate out the protein you're interested in plus any proteins that specifically bind to it. And the, one of the methods is this use of tandem affinity purification tags has enhanced the, the procedure, allows two purification steps, eliminating loosely attached proteins and minimizing non-specific binding. And it, it works like this. So you make the, the cDNA with the epitope tag, express it in cells, and then you make the cell extract, you precipitate the tag protein with a sp specific antibody, then you can run that on a gel and identify the bands that come out with the, the pure tag protein along with, you can cut these out of the gel and actually send them through a mass spectrometer and identify what proteins these are. So, and then the TAP procedure is a little bit different. Remember how I was telling you you could, those fusion proteins for purifying, you can add a protease site. So that's what they do here. So they have a calmodulin binding peptide, which is fused to the protein you're interested in, which is fused to a protein A molecule. And in between, there's the TEV protease cleavage site. So you produce this whole complex in your cells. You, you have the crude cell extract. IgG beads will bind to the protein A. You, you're going to wash away anything that doesn't bind to that complex. And then you're going to use your TEV protease that cleaves at that TEV site. And then you'll be left with this calmodulin affinity, or this calmodulin portion. You run it through a calmodulin affinity column, and it'll, it'll only collect the proteins that are tightly bound with the protein of interest so you can characterize what kind of proteins are interacting with that. Another method is this yeast two hybrid system. Protein of interest is tagged with the GAL4 activation domain. DNA library with all yeast genes are tagged with the GAL4 binding domain and the reporter gene under control of GAL4. And then what happens is the differentially tagged proteins must interact to get expression. So where you get expression of the reporter gene is where those proteins interact. And the animation they, they gave for that is pretty good if I can do that again without killing this. Let me see. like having two slides up at the same time. There we go. A genetic approach to defining protein-protein interactions is based on the properties of the GAL4 protein, or GAL4P, which activates the transcription of certain genes in yeast. GAL4P has two domains, one that binds to a specific DNA sequence and another that activates RNA polymerase, which synthesizes mRNA from an adjacent gene. In the yeast 2 hybrid method, the GAL4 protein is essentially divided in two, and each half is fused to other proteins, designated X and Y. If proteins X and Y can bind to each other, the fusion proteins come together and can activate RNA polymerase, increasing transcription from the adjacent reporter gene. In the yeast 2 hybrid procedure, the coding regions for the two domains are spliced into separate plasmids. The coding region for a protein of interest called the bait is fused to the DNA binding domain. The bait will be used to fish for proteins that can bind to it thereby bringing the two fusion proteins together. Each plasmid also has a selectable marker. Trip and Lu represent genes necessary for the biosynthesis of tryptophan and leucine, essential amino acids. Although a single fish plasmid is shown here, in fact, an entire cDNA library is created using the fish plasmid. 
In this way, the coding regions for a large number of proteins are fused to the activation domain of GAL4 protein. Both types of plasmids are transformed into yeast cells. The cells are placed in amino acid deficient medium so that only those containing both plasmids will grow. The cells are plated on a medium in which the yeast cannot survive unless the reporter gene is expressed. In this example, the reporter gene encodes a protein required for histidine biosynthesis. Thus, all surviving colonies have interacting protein fusion pairs that allow the transcription of the his reporter gene. This procedure allows for a large-scale screening for proteins that interact in the cell. You guys understand that? So what makes this possible is these two domains of this original protein don't really need each other to do their specific, well, they need each other to get the protein expression, but this portion of the protein is specifically will bind to the DNA at the promoter region, the GAL4P binding site. This one specifically binds to the RNA polymerase. So in or, you have to have those two together to get the expression, which is where you get the interacting of the fusion proteins that you produce, you'll actually get reporter gene expression. So. Do they both express themselves? Do they what? Do they both express themselves after? Yeah, so you put the plasmid in, basically is going to be coding for this portion of the protein with this little orange piece. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the proteins you're interested in to see what interacts with it, right? This is another protein that you're, you're just randomly, you, 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 you clone random cDNAs into a vector that fuses this protein with this, you know, GAL4P portion of a protein. So when these two are brought together, you, you make the whole and you're able to express whatever gene is down here. And in this example, they use the reporter gene as the, the, the gene to make histidine. And you're growing the yeast in histidine deficient media in this case. So only the cells that have an interaction will be able to survive on the histidine. Does that make sense? So DNA microarrays basically will show differences in gene expression. So what they do is microarray chips, they, they, they produce very tiny fragments of oligonucleotides on a glass chip in specific regions with specific sequences that are gonna be able to, gonna be, be able to, to, to base pair with any cDNA that might be there in a cell system. So first you extract mRNA converted to cDNA from, from different samples, and then those cDNA samples that you produce, or if you want to use the mRNA, but it's much less stable, are tagged fluorescently. So typically you have red and green fluorescent tags that are going to be in the two different groups. And you can analyze on the same chip, which shows different, you, you can measure the levels of cDNA bound to specific sequences on that array. And they have it like this, so you have a program of desired sequences on a solid surface and you add that, you know, with that chemical synthesis of how you produce DNA, phosphoamorodite chemistry basically. Solution containing an activated A goes in and you block certain ones that where you don't want the A's to go and then you don't have them blocked where they're, they're not. The A's will get added. Then you have the activated G's, they get added, you block other spots. 
the light basically is going to inactivate them. And you keep doing that until you, many more cycles until you get specific sequences on each little tiny spot. You take your cells, if you want to compare like a fertilized egg message to tadpole message, you make cDNA differentially tagged, one's green, one's red, and then you incubate it on the array, hybridize basically your cDNA to the array, and by reading the fluorescence on the array, you can quantify how much of each of these, how much cDNA from, from each different coding sequences is is bound and you can compare the, the gene expression patterns in two different systems basically. So you, this is like a fertilized egg with a more mature tadpole. You can see which genes are on in early stages of development versus old, later stages. You can also compare diseased to non-diseased tissue if you, or if you manipulate one gene you can see how that affects gene expression patterns. So that's the usefulness of microarrays, and this is what a real microarray looks like. Although this is like really tiny, this is all blown up, showing you the differential expression patterns. So the DNA microarrays they'll allow simultaneous screening, many thousands of genes through high throughput screening, genome-wide type geno genotyping, which genes are present in this individual tissue specific expression. You can look at one tissue versus the other or mutational analysis, which genes have been mutated. So genomic sequencing, like, what was it, like 10 years ago we, or so we, we sequenced the, the first genome? And we did that via Sanger sequencing. So for the most part, that took forever, right? But we got more modern techniques. Anybody describe Sanger sequencing to me? Yeah, but what, what, what are, what's one of the important components of Sanger sequencing? Do you know? So they have a good animation here too. I'm separating the DNA by, by number. So I'll show you here. In this example of the dideoxy method for sequencing DNA, a short radio labeled primer is annealed to the single stranded DNA to be sequenced. The DNA serves as a template for in vitro DNA synthesis. The DNA primer mixture is split into four separate tubes. DNA polymerase and a solution of DNTPs are added to each tube. One of the four 2 prime, 3 prime dideoxy NTPs or DDNTPs is mixed into each tube at a concentration 100 times lower than the DNTP concentration. DNTPs differ from DDNTPs at the 3 prime carbon on the sugar molecule. DNTPs have a hydroxyl group attached to the 3 prime carbon, whereas DDNTPs have a hydrogen atom attached to this carbon. DNA polymerase uses the DNTPs to elongate the primer DNA. The occasional incorporation of a DDNTP terminates the polymerization reaction since the absence of a 3' hydroxyl blocks addition of the next nucleotide. The DDNTPs are incorporated randomly, resulting in terminated fragments of different lengths. The terminated fragments from each of the four reactions are denatured and separated by size using gel electrophoresis. The gel is autoradiographed in order to visually detect the labeled DNA fragments. The resulting ladder is read from bottom to top. So this is the really old, old school way of Sanger sequencing. The complementary sequence of the original DNA template. What you're going to be doing, and anybody who's take, going to take methods two, is similar to this, but rather than having four reaction tubes and radio labels, we don't want radio labels here. We have one reaction tube, and you have four dideoxyfluorescent labeled nucleotides. So they're labeled with a fluorescent label, different color for each base, 
that's dideoxy. And then you run it through capillary electrophoresis to measure the fluorescence that comes off. So that's the original way how they sequenced the genome too. So it's a, quite a slow process. But these days there's the more modern methods. So there's more modern me methods where you can measure a whole genome basically in a day. So full genomes are mobilized on a chip in fragments as a few of 100 bases long. So first you take the, the, the genomic DNA, you make fragments out of it so, so such that they're just 100 bases long, immobilize it, and then all are sequenced at once allowing for faster detection. And then whereas with Sanger sequencing you'd have to do multiple reactions with each portion of DNA. About a thousand base pairs is as long as you could do for each reaction and then run it on a capillary which takes a couple hours to separate those. So pyrosequencing involves synthesizing DNA from the template, single nucleotide available at a time. Each nucleotide added results in a pulse of light. So basically the, the deoxynucleotide triphosphates, when they get added to the DNA, you release pyrophosphate. There's an enzyme added that takes the pyrophosphate and makes ATP. That ATP then gets get consumed by luciferase that's in that mixture. Anybody know what luciferase is? Anybody ever catch fireflies? Yeah, yeah fireflies produce luciferase. Luciferase is an enzyme that breaks down luciferin and then emits light as a byproduct. So in this reaction mixture, anytime you add a base, if that releases pyrophosphate, it gets consumed making ATP, which then immediately gets consumed with the luciferase, producing a pulse of light. And that light's detected by a detector, and you know if you see the pulse of light, that little spot where that oligonucleotide is from your genome codes for that gene. You can read four to 500 nucleotides in, in, in the sequence basically that way. And then there's reversible terminator sequencing. You have a fluorescent labeled terminal nucleotide is added to the sequence and detected and the terminal nucleotide is removed. Sequence extended at the next nucleotide is detected. And there's a, I think I got, found these movies to hope, hopefully help you under visualize these sequencing techniques. So this is the pyro sequencing. So there's pyrophosphate. ATP sulfurylase converts it to ATP, which then luciferase will use producing light. And you can measure how much light you only give it the nucleotides one at a time on this little spot. And this is done in like a 486 well plate simultaneously reading each each well for light. So this one was 1G added this we get a triple peak, so you know the three A's there in that sequence.
So then there's reversible terminator sequencing, and they've got a nice video here. The Illumina Genome Analyzer Sequencing Technology. The key to the genome analyzer's unmatched flexibility, accuracy, and ease of use is Illumina's sequencing it's a commercial. technology. Commercial. Let's look at the chemistry for the three steps in the genome analyzer for workflow. Library preparation, cluster generation, and sequencing. Library preparation. The genome analyzer performs massively parallel sequencing of hundreds of millions of fragments of DNA. First, the DNA is fragmented. Sheared ends are repaired and adenylated. Adapter oligos are ligated to both ends of the fragments. These fragments are then size selected and purified. Cluster generation. On the CBOP cluster system, single molecules are isothermally amplified in a flow cell to prepare them for high throughput sequencing. The 8-channel genome analyzer flow cell has a dense lawn of oligos grafted to its surface. These oligos bind to the adapters ligated to the library fragments. Single DNA molecules hybridize to the lawn of oligos. Bound fragments are extended to create copies. These copies are covalently bound to the flow cell surface. Each library fragment is clonally amplified through a series of extensions and isothermal bridge amplifications resulting in hundreds of millions of unique clusters. The reverse strands are cleaved and washed away. Ends are blocked and a sequencing primer is hybridized to the DNA templates. After cluster generation, the libraries are ready for sequencing. Sequencing. On the genome analyzer, Hundreds of millions of clusters are sequenced simultaneously. The DNA templates are sequenced base by base, in parallel, using four fluorescently labeled, reversibly terminated nucleotides. All four bases compete with each other to bind to the template. This natural competition ensures the highest accuracy. After each round of synthesis, the clusters are excited by a laser emitting a color that identifies the newly added base. The fluorescent label and blocking group are then removed, allowing for the addition of the next base. This proprietary chemistry reads a single base in each cycle, enabling accurate sequencing through difficult regions such as homopolymers and repetitive sequences. So they have a fluorescent label that blocks that three, three prime OH group. So it basically protects it from being added. And they compete different colored fluorescent labels. So then you add that, read the fluorescence, you can remove that protecting group and then continue with the next reaction. So that's how you can sequence basically genome in about a day is those two methods. So. So human, when they've isolated the genome, and if you look at this, just 1.5% of the genome is what contains protein coding regions. The vast majority of our genome are either introns, miscellaneous, long repetitive sequences, segment duplications, simple sequence repeats, other transposons, these are all transposons, signs and lines. So. They're short ones and long ones. So. so, and then the human genome contains many different protein types. About 37.5% are still unknown. Cytoskeletal proteins, about 3%. Enzymes, 16.2. Extracellular structures, about 3. And immune proteins, 1.3. Membrane proteins, 2.4. Miscellaneous, about 4.5. Nucleic acid binding proteins are about 9.8%. Receptors are 5.2%. Transport proteins, 3.4%. Regulatory proteins, 4.1%. And signaling proteins, about 2.7%. So. so, and that's it, basically, what I'm going to cover for the, the chapter. Any questions? Or? for
of data and technology has advanced um, over the next couple of years? Do you, do you expect anything, any new new outbreaks to uh, oh. help with DNA sequencing is pretty fast these days because, like I said, you can sequence in about a day. Now, they are, I think, making it cheaper now. I think they're, they're doing it. They, you can get your whole genome sequenced for less than $2,000. So, but what do you do with all that information? You've got billions of base pairs. You have to make sense of that, right? So that's where, you know, computer analysis of the sequence will come in. So you look at SNPs and well, things like that. I know that there's specific fragments that you can look up online, but I've never, never. Yeah, most of what you can look up online are specific coding sequences. Right. If you look, the vast majority, only 1.5% of our sequence is coding. The vast majority are other, yeah. other stuff. So. Huh? That's what? Next class. Yeah. Hello. Hey. What is the extra credit again? Because I didn't get a chance to write it down very well. So